Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. Um, if you're looking for the panel on early stage funding, you've come to the right place. My name is Andrew McComb. I'm with Early Stage Partners. We're a Midwest focused venture capital fund. True to our name, we do do very early stage investing. We've got about $100 million under management. I manage the Michigan office. Um, I'm going to just quickly introduce. Yeah, I'll finish up the road. I'm. Uh, I'm going to just quickly uh, allow our panel to, well, I'll, I'll sort of go down and just do names, and as they speak, they can introduce themselves. Um, but what we'd like to do in terms of the funding round, we're going to start with venture capital and move on down the line. And the thing about venture capital, a lot of people think, I need venture capital. The reality is very few people need venture capital, and very few types of businesses are suitable for venture capital. There's a lot of other options out there, and that's what the majority of our panel is going to be talking about. So first, I'll introduce Dale Grogan from the Michigan Accelerator Fund. And Dale is a real live VC. We're going to pin a target on his back afterwards so you can find him. And uh, take it away, Dale. Great. So thank you, everyone. I don't have horns. Uh, I don't worship the dead. Um, but, I, but I am an unabashed venture capitalist. In the uh, nine and a half minutes that I have, I think I'm going to talk a little bit about venture capital, what it is that we do, what it is we like, and some of the things, pitfalls to be weary of. Um, I think the most important thing about venture capital is, as Andy said, it's not necessarily for everybody. The statistics are pretty interesting. Uh, nationally, on a, on a venture capital basis, one out of 100 deals that come to us actually get funded, so it's a very, very small slice. That's not necessarily because uh, the deals are not worthy, but it's just that we have very specific investment parameters. Uh, the the um, supporting statement to that that is of value is that according to a RAND study, venture capital companies are five times more likely to be successful in terms of getting to an exit than those that are not backed by venture capital. The reason for that is pretty simple. It's not because we're smarter than anybody else. It's just that we demand accountability. We are a dispassionate third-party investor who's motivated by generating uh, returns. So that's what we do. Um, a perfect day in the life of a, a venture capitalist is this. We uh, stroll into the office about 10.30 in the morning with a nice latte in our hand. Our beautiful secretary uh, greets us with a, with a large stack of checks. Um, and then we, we hear a pitch. A perfect pitch is a venture capitalist-based uh, pitch is an entrepreneur comes in and it says, this is my third venture capital startup. Uh, my last two exits, we made 200, 300 million dollars. We have a groundbreaking technology that's completely protected by intellectual properties. We have a short path to uh, profitability, and we think the exit multiples are a 10 or a 20. It's a perfect day, and then we leave it in. I have not had a perfect day in the venture capital business yet. It doesn't exist. But there are some things that we do, that we do like and do insist upon there. They're the five Ps of venture capital investing that we want. The first one is people. We always, always, always invest in people. And I'm not going to steal Jody's, Jody's line, but it's something about a horse and a giant, right? <laughs> it's the people that matter, because when you invest in early stage venture capital, you're not looking at the track record of the company. You're not looking at the maturity of the industry. You are looking at the people. Can they deliver on what they say they can do? That really, really matters above all else. 10 out of 10, that's the thing that we measure. The second thing that we measure is the potential. Is there the potential to make a lot of money in the company? In other words, is the market size substantial? If we're, if we're looking at um, a diabetes drug, that's something that is an enormous market, right? So we talk about total addressable market, and we also talk about total reachable market. The reachable market is something that this company can logically get to. 
If we use this diabetes uh, drug, for example, it doesn't really matter if three quarters of the world uh, is not reachable by this company. If, if all the world is outside the United States and our business is confined to the United States, that is of no value, right? It's just of no value. The third P is product. You have to have something that is groundbreaking. You have to have a better widget or something that's novel. Coming along and saying, well, I've got the 13th of this left-handed widget, the 13th kind, but mine is a little better because it's blue, is really not substantially meaningful for us. The fourth thing is you have to have protection, right? Intellectual property matters. In early stage investing, that is one of the only things that is tangible that you can hang your hat on, right? It, it matters to be able to say, we have a, a, not one patent, but a body of patents that protect this thing uh, circumferentially, we like that. And the last thing, of course, the fifth piece is passion. You have to have somebody that cares about what they do. If they don't, why are we going to get? Why are we going to care? What's going to motivate us? So those are the things that we look for at a very high level. But at the end of the day, it really boils down to our relationship with the with the entrepreneur. So venture capitalists typically invest in in very limited categories. The idea is that the generals are gone. So just like in medicine, you know, we, we want to focus on, on a couple of things. And with our fund, we do early stage venture investing in Michigan, mostly in life sciences. That kind of that kind of narrows it down. We we have we have the mandate to do other things, but you invest in what you know, right? That's what that's what Peter Lynch from Fidelity <coughs> said. You know, you invest in what you know. You go to Walmart, and if you see the things flying off the shelves, you know those are good companies that you want to invest in. Green Mountain Coffee, right? Everyone's got a Keurig. That, that's a good company that everyone understands, right? So those are the kinds of things that we do. Our investment criteria is no different than any other venture capitalist. We look at a deal, we read the executive summary, we talk to management, we vet it around through our advisory boards, folks that should know about this. If we can't find anybody that knows about it, we have to pass because if, if we don't have a trusted source that can tell us that this esoteric science is very, very good, then we just can't make that bet. And then the final thing that I'll leave you with, and then I'll turn it over to, to the rest of the panel, is when it, when it comes to looking at the types of investment, scale really matters. As Andy has often said, size matters. Andy has never said that. <laughs> You would say that though, wouldn't you? All the time. Okay. All right. So, anyway, is this on? Is this microphone on? Anyway, um, when you look at investing, venture capitalists typically look at a seven to ten times return. That's the number that they want. So, if you look at some simple math here, let's say we're willing to invest ten percent into a company, or or a million dollars into a company, and that gets us ten percent on a fully diluted basis. If we get a million dollars and we need a 10x, that's $10 million of return. And if we own 10% of the company, that's a $100 million return. So we've got to look at companies that have the ability to get to that 30, 40, 50, $100 million exit so that we can get the returns that we need because we are, we are culpable to our limited partners, right? Our job is to make money for our limited partners. And we know we're going to strike out, absolutely strike out, six times out of ten. We're going to get a couple singles, a couple of doubles, and one of the companies is going to be the home line. That's that's the simple math. The art would be knowing if we if, which the home run company would be on the front side, except that still hasn't happened. So that's venture capital in a nutshell. And now I think we have Joe Emanuel to talk about. Thanks, Dale. And I, I promised to introduce a panel, and I'm remiss, I didn't. Um, Dale, we've got Jody Vanderbilt, who runs the Grand Angels, and she'll be talking about angel investing. Michael Couric is uh, Ann Arbor based. He uh, is with a firm called Biotech Business Consultants. Despite the name, they do things other than biotech. But uh, one of their uh, core sort of niche areas that they're very, very good at is helping people get government grants. And then finally, Skip Sims is going to back clean up, and Skip it runs the um, accelerator at uh, Spark and Pre-Seed Fund, and he's going to talk about some of the other options uh, for funding your company, not the least of which is customer revenue, one of my favorites.
theo dõi chơi Thank you, Andrew, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon and talk a little bit about angel investing with all of you. Uh, let me start out by just doing a little bit of compare and contrast between angel and venture capital. Um, as, as you probably know, venture capital is typically two or three general partners who manage the fund and limited partners whose money gets invested. So the general partners do the research, the diligence, make the decisions. They send you an email or, or make a phone call and say, okay, I need 10% of your capital commitment, thank you very much, and I'm going to be invested in, in X deal. Uh, angels work very differently in that we're a very active group of investors and everybody makes their own investment decision. So we have a common due diligence process and a, and a single term sheet that we all use, those, those who invest. We bring presentations to our membership, but everybody gets to make their own decision about whether they're in the deal. And at the end of the meeting, if we've got enough money committed to, to fund the deal, fine, we can go forward with deeper due diligence and ultimately complete the deal. If there is not enough money committed to fully fund the organi organization, the business, we have to walk away from that deal. We're not gonna we're not gonna underfund a deal or allow a deal to be undercapitalized. So we're always um, what what we do. The deals that we can do depend entirely on the kinds of deals our individual members decide they want to put their money into. So that's a that's a you know very important difference between angel and venture capital. We typically precede venture capital in the funding continuum. So if you start with family and friends which is where most entrepreneurs get their initial money. It's people who are making a decision of the heart, basically. They invest in you because they care about you. And um, uh, from then you move to angel investing, where we try to be a little more dispassionate about the whole thing and start making um, um, much more thoughtful decisions as opposed to, to decisions based on who we're related to or who we're friends with. And then eventually down the road comes venture capital. Most of our deals will never get venture capital, frankly. They will have an exit or, or perhaps become a lifestyle business um, long before they would even think about venture capital investing. So a handful of angel deals will get venture capital money, but not very many. And in fact, um, um, on a national basis, Angels and VCs probably invest about the same amount of money every year. Angels put far less in the many more deals. So the, the range typically for an angel investment is somewhere between $250,000 and $750 or a million dollars. Less than $250, it's not worth it because of the cost of doing the deal. The time and energy it takes to do the diligence, the legal fees, all of those sorts of things. And $250 is a pretty good indication that the company has made enough progress that they're probably about ready for angel money. Um, so what do we look for in a deal? Um, deals four P or five P's are perfect. We don't say it in the same way, but we look for many of the same things. Um, and first of all, it is the entrepreneur, or we would say you invest in the jockey, not the horse. You want somebody who is very passionate, believes 100% in what they're doing, spends the time and the energy it takes to do it. Um, there's no vacations and very few Saturdays when you're not there. And those are the kind of people you want to invest in, are those people who live, sleep, breathe, eat this stuff, and are just uh, determined to make it work. Um, with a little bit of a balance of some coachability and humility and understanding um, they don't know everything. So it's always that fine balance between, I'm going to do it, I know this works, and yeah, I know I don't know everything. Help me understand how I should be thinking about this. So we want a very passionate entrepreneur. We're looking for somebody who's got a solution to a real problem. Um, so don't, as Dale said, I don't want to hear that, well, you just invented the blue, the blue solution to a problem when there are already 13 other colors out there. We want a, a, a real problem that nobody else has solved and we want a unique solution to that problem where there is some intellectual property that creates a barrier to entry, a barrier to your competitors coming in and just copying what you've done. Then we are looking for somebody who understands what their market is. Uh, you need to know who, who's gonna buy your product and how to get to them, how to sell it to them, 
and that they're going to pay a profitable price for your product. Um, we don't want to hear, well, this is a billion dollar market and all I need is, you know, 0.01% and I'm going to make a million dollars the first year. Well, you're not. And, and we don't appreciate hearing, well, all I need to do is throw this up on the internet. People are going to go do a Google search, find my product, know it is the best solution they've ever seen to their problem, and I'm going to make a million dollars. No, that's not going to happen. Um, someday, the internet may augment your sales. But we want to know that you know how to get to customer one, customer two, customer three. You build this thing up from the bottom, and um, that you have realistic understanding of how many units you're going to sell in the first few years, and what the, what the profitable price of that product is going to be, that you've done enough studies to know that your customers are going to pay that price for your product. Um, and that, that there's some um, rationality to the, to the business plan that you present to us. Even so, <clears throat> excuse me, when we run our projected IRRs, we'll look at about half of the EBITDA you project and about half of a multiple for your industry. And at that point, if you can show that you have a chance of hitting a 35 to 40 percent annual rate of return, then we'll start to look more carefully at your company and your product and think about whether you want to do more diligence on the wheel. Um, let me just go to our process. Uh, I think angels, every angel group, of course, has some, some unique ways in which they do things, but I don't think we're too much different than most angel groups around here. We, we have a website, www.grandangels.org, and our application is on the website. We are not, we don't participate in BEST or any of the other uh, solutions out there where we can go out and pick the applications we're interested in. We want a very, it's a, it's a pretty personal relationship. When you get to know somebody and you want to write a check to invest in them, I want that person to go to our website to know exactly the kind of criteria we're looking for in a deal and apply to us when they believe that they fit our criteria and this, this actually could be a marriage that could work. So, so go to our website, check things out, complete our application. Um, it will take us probably, it could take us anywhere from two weeks to a month, frankly, um, to give you much of a response. It just depends on our, our deal flow at the time. But we try to get back fairly quickly to people and, it, and it say no. If I, can, if I can get back to you in 48 hours and say thank you, but you really don't fit our criteria, um, I try to do that. Um, within a couple of more weeks, we could take a little deeper look and again say, is this a yes or a no point? Go or no go? Do you fit? Do you not fit? So uh, one of the things we've really, we really work on is trying to get to know pretty quickly. And honestly, it can take easily six months to actually fund a deal. I can't tell you what our average is, but I think our fastest is probably two to three months when I've been watching a company for a couple of years and then they finally came and applied. Um, it just takes time to, to do the diligence, to get to know the entrepreneur, to feel comfortable with the company, and it takes time when you're trying to, you know, if you want to, if you want to raise three hundred fifty thousand dollars at about twenty-five thousand dollars a unit, you need fourteen investors minimum who are willing to put money in your company. It takes time to bring a group along and get that many people who really do, do uh, want to write a check for you. So don't assume that you can go to an angel group and think you're going to get funding in a month or so. That they're going to look at your deal and say, boy, I haven't even, I've never seen anything, that's cool, this is cool, let's go after it. It's just, it takes time. So make sure that you think about your family friends funding and some other grants probably in the, in the meantime as you kind of line up your, your uh, thinking about asking for angel money. Um, normally, when we do invest, we expect the company to have about a five-member board. Two people who represent management, two people who represent the investors, and one person who's a business sector, sector expert. So the idea is that you've got a five-member team there who bring the right skills to the table in order to um, nurture the company along. And sometimes an advisory board is helpful as well with, with people who have the right business sector experience that 
that can bring, begin to open doors and, and help with some of the skills that you need. Um, we assume that we'll get an exit in probably seven to ten years in this economic climate. Um, so we're patient money, but we're not a fund. So we don't have to satisfy our limited partners that in ten years we're going to have exited all their deals and made a return to them. If the company takes more than 10 years, we'll continue to work with the company as long as we're making progress uh, and, and not necessarily push for an exit if the timing isn't right for that. Um, so our yield rate is about 3% from application to investment, uh, which is pretty typical for angel groups in, uh, in the country. Our average investment size is about $390,000 over sometimes several rounds or sometimes several tranches. After a little bit of experience, we've come to the conclusion that we need to look at how much money it's going to take to get the company cash flow positive. Um, so rather than invest you know, a minimal amount of money and then have the entrepreneur come back and say, okay, I've, I've accomplished X, Y, and Z in the last 12 months and now I need another round, that's just a distraction. I'd rather say, what do you need in the next 24 months, give or take, to really get to cash flow positive uh, so that you've got um, uh, a good foundation on which to go out and look for your next, next round of funding. Or if you don't get the funding, you at least have a business that's got customers that's generating positive cash flow that has some value for your investors. Um, so I'll let it go there and uh, turn it over to Michael and any questions you have we can address shortly. Thank you, Jody. Hi, my name is Mike Heurick. Um, I'd like to start off with a, with a question. First of all, uh, how many of uh, you in the audience are actively looking for money for your company or your new venture? Show of hands. Um, so about 40% or so. Um, I'm sure that, that you have discovered that one of the biggest hurdles you're facing is, uh, is finding that early stage money. Uh, Jody talked about the friends and family as the, um, the most common source of, uh, of the earliest funds into a company. But when you need that second injection and, and a more substantial amount of money, um, it is, especially for a deal that involves a significant amount of tech, uh, technical risk, technology risk, there are very few sources for that, uh, for that kind of high risk money. And one of the best of those um, right now are, are government grants, and specifically two federal programs uh, designed for small business. Um, there are actually two sister programs, one called SBIR and STTR, Small Business Innovation Research and Small Business Technology Transfer. Together, those two programs award two plus billion dollars um, a year for research and development in small businesses. Um, small businesses for these programs are defined as less than 500 employees, so not necessarily small, small, but uh, probably uh, the majority of the funds are awarded to companies with less than 25 employees. So it is, it is really a source for early stage, high risk funding of small, uh, of small companies. Um, the, there are 11 federal agencies that are involved in these programs, and they award a total of between 6,000 and 7,000 uh, grants or contracts a year. This is non-dilutive funding, meaning that whether the project succeeds or doesn't succeed, you're not uh, expected to pay back the, the funding. Um, it is, uh, the program is designed in two phases. Phase one, is up to $150,000 to demonstrate feasibility for your, for your idea. If that's successful, you apply for a, a phase two for up to a million dollars, typically. So that the, the overall project is typically three years in duration and costs in the range of a million, $1.1 million. Um, in some cases, that may be enough funding to actually develop a product and, and have it ready for market. In other cases, in other, in other sectors, you're, you're barely scratching the surface, for example, if you're trying to do drug development or medical device development. But, but, the, but it is possible to win multiple awards for the, for the same product and certainly for the same company. 
Um, not surprisingly, the bulk of the money is awarded by the, the largest federal agencies. The Department of Defense awards about half of that $2 billion. And Health and Human Services, primarily the National Institutes of Health, award about $650 million a year. Um, the program was started in, in 1982, so it's got a long and successful history. The, uh, the original objectives are to um, tap small businesses for innovative ideas. And it's, it's at, at its heart an economic development program. The, the government doesn't expect to get a financial return, but it does expect to get a, a return in terms of jobs created and new products created, new industries created possibly by these kind of companies that receive these awards. And in that sense, um, a number of, of uh, uh, committees and, uh, from the National Academies and others that have looked at the program over the last 25 years have judged it a success. Recently, uh, the programs have been reauthorized for uh, for six years, so they're going to they're guaranteed to run now through September of 2017. But that legislation also um, made some changes in the program. A couple of the changes are good. They're going to be increasing the amount of uh, money uh, gradually over the next six years that uh, <coughs> that is budgeted for these programs, so that. Uh, um, all things being equal in terms of the budgets for these agencies, uh, by 2017, the, the program should be awarding about $2.8 billion uh, annually. The other change is that um, companies that are funded uh, by venture capitalists, even companies that are majority owned by venture capitalists, will become eligible to participate in this nationwide competition, because it is a nationwide competition. You have to be a U.S. company, as I said, less than 500 employees. So you're competing with, com with companies in your sector. Your proposals are competing with them uh, on a national level. Um, the VC companies um, um, are eligible to receive up to 25% of the funding from three agencies, the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, and the Department of Energy. The other eight agencies can expand up to 15% of their total funds you know, uh, for venture-backed companies. Um, the, other, the other change that uh, in, in some cases is going to be an improvement is to try to speed up the review process. So uh, the, 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 the law says that now uh, most agencies have to uh, get a decision back to, to you uh, within, six, within 90 days of the, the proposal submission date. Uh, that's a little bit faster than the DOD and uh, some of the other agencies do now, but there are exceptions. The, the agencies that you peer review, meaning they recruit uh, experts from the, uh, from the general public to review the proposals, they have up to 12 months to review. So National, National Institutes of Health, National Science, Science Foundation, and, and DOE use peer review um, on it. <clears throat> all right, so I'm making it sound like it's all good news. You, know, you don't have to pay back the money, and uh, there's, there's lots, of, lots of money there. It's not all um, a, a bed of roses, really. The competition is very, uh, very keen. The average uh, success rate for phase one proposals is about 16% in 2010. That's, compare that, one out of six to what Dale was talking about in terms of venture capital, one out of 100. So the odds are pretty good, even if you're just average. Um, those success rates range from 21% uh, for NASA down to uh, about 4% for EPA. But uh, the, the big agencies are in the 15 to 20% success rate. Um, you, you are allowed uh, by, by many of the agencies to resubmit a proposal. So if you're, if you're rejected, you get comments on what the weak, weaknesses are in the proposal, and you get a chance to correct those and, and resubmit, usually one time. Um, so when you think about this, it's, it's, uh, the program is administered by the Small Business Administration, but each of the 11 agencies are allowed to customize the program to their needs. So uh, there's not one set of rules that will apply for all the agencies. You have to 
determine where your opportunities lie, where your technology fits into, into the various agencies, and then learn the rules for those agencies. Fortunately, there are uh, programs both here in Michigan and in other, in other neighboring states to, uh, to assist small businesses in preparing proposals and, and competing in this, uh, in this national competition. Um, probably the, 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 the most li serious limitation in my mind is that these funds can be used only for research and development. So you can't use them for business development purposes, even for uh, protecting your, your intellectual property. So you can't use it to file your patent applications. You can't use it for market research. Um, you really can't use it to pay your executive salaries unless they're working on the, the R&D project itself. So that means that you have to have another source of funding because you should be doing your business development in parallel with your product development. Um, fortunately, there are um, some programs here in Michigan. I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Skip to talk about these programs that provide matching funds that give you a little bit more flexibility on how you spend that, that money. So uh, answer your question before we finish. Skip. Thank you, Michael. So <clears throat> good afternoon and welcome. How lucky are you to be a startup in Michigan? I mean that sincerely. We are the envy of most other states in the country because of the ecosystem that our state has put together on your behalf to help you succeed and get to the point where you can attract and let the private sector take over and grow you into however large of a business you want to end up being. And I hope that what I'm about to, to lay out for you kind of reinforces that. And I can assure you that I don't know of any other state in the country that offers you the variety of support uh, in one place, as Michigan does, as I'm about to outline for you. Let's start first and foremost with the SBTDC, Small Business Technology Development Center, statewide organization, paid for in large part by the SBA. All of their services are free. Any of you could go to them and ask for any kind of help in terms of uh, guidance, referral, direction, uh, in developing your business plan, in helping with your strategy, with doing any kind of road mapping for your technology, all of that's free. All you gotta do is ask. And there's a technologist somewhere in the state near you who'll be happy to meet with you repeatedly to help you along that path and get to a point where you've got a solid business concept and construct that you can begin to build on. We've got a network of smart zones created by our legislature 10 years ago, 11 years ago. There's 14 now smart zones around the state. Ann Arbor Spark is one, Automation Alley is one, Tech Town, uh, OU Incubator, Macomb Incubator, uh, Smith in Kalamazoo, there's one in uh, Muskegon, Grand Rapids, they're all over the state. Their purpose is, and by legislation, what, what is called upon to be a smart zone is a connection between a local economic development group and a university. And collaborating together, bringing resources that, again, you can take advantage of. And the smart zones will provide you assistance with uh, maybe finalizing your business plan, getting it prepared for going to market, looking for funding, looking for partners, looking for customers. Smart zones also can offer, uh, in some instances, uh, the ability to open those doors for those people, including customers and investors. Make introductions for you, very valuable uh, service. That's all free. Uh, most smart zones, and even you don't have to be a smart zone, and you've got incubators all over the state. Uh, we've got a lot of kitchen incubators, if any of you are interested in getting into catering, but uh, there's a lot of technology-based uh, incubators around. Spark happens to manage three of them. We have a life science uh, wet lab incubator in Plymouth. We've got two, we've got an innovation incubator in uh, Ypsilanti, and we've got a technology-based incubator in, in Ann Arbor. But there are incubators all over the state that provide you uh, a place to land when you're ready to move out of the house. Or the university's kicking you out of the lab. There are places for you to land that are relatively inexpensive, 
that will provide you your own phone number, will provide you a copier, will provide you a business environment, a business address, conference rooms, where you can meet with potential customers or potential investors, your own staff or consultants that you're using, a valuable meeting space. That's what we've been told is the most valuable thing Spark Central provides our incubator tenants, and that's conference rooms. And the rent's reasonable. <coughs> However, and this applies to all of these programs, our idea is to move you as quickly as possible out of our programs. I'll circle back to that in a moment. Uh, after the smart zones, incubators, etc., then there are other ways, uh, there are other programs out there for you to tap into that provide capital. Uh, of various forms. There are very few grants anymore, and uh, I think that message has gotten out that uh, I'm getting fewer and fewer entrepreneurs calling us and saying, okay, I want, uh, I, I need some capital, here's what I need it for, and uh, by the way, I need it to be free. Well, that's not happening much anymore. Uh, we're no longer writing checks without strings attached. But there are, uh, there is one, and that's the one Mike just alluded to, in that the state provided and the SBTDC administers uh, the Emerging Technology Fund, which is a match grant to the SBIR grant. The one thing you do need to keep in mind is that you actually have to apply for that grant before you apply to the federal agency <coughs> for the SBIR grant. That's the one little caveat that they put in there and they're sticklers about it. But what it boils down to is if you apply to DOD or NIH or DOE or wherever, and you get a phase one grant, generally in the $100,000 range, what this ETF grant will provide is $40,000 of cash for you to do business development and to fund your operating capital, which as Mike said, the SBIR doesn't cover. If you get a phase two grant, you can get up to $125,000 out of this program. Again, it's free. It starts out with $40,000 you get as soon as you get uh, approval. And then to get the other $85,000 though, you need to come in, uh, you need to have an, a match. It can be out of your own pocket, it can be friends and family, uh, it can be from an angel investor, it can be from a variety of sources, but it does have to be matched, that uh, balance of $85,000. But that's free money. Another source of free money our business plan competitions. A lot of people would say we've got too many now. And there are days I feel that way too. But at the same time, one of the things we're trying to, uh, the two uh, primary business plan competitions that exist in, in Michigan uh, that are statewide and open to everybody is GLAQ, Great Lakes Entrepreneurs Quest, and the Accelerate Michigan uh, Innovation Competition. That's free money when you win. Uh, and those programs, uh, GLEQs in particular, provides free mentoring and assistance as you go through their program and compete. So even if you don't get a dime, you do, do get a lot of assistance, help, guidance, uh, and a lot of mentoring uh, that's extremely valuable uh, that their program provides. The Accelerate Michigan competition, the nice thing about that one is that they've got a big pot of money. There's a million dollars that they give away uh, in the fall. So uh, what we're trying to do, and all the universities uh, have uh, business plan competitions of various types, and they've got a lot of them, and in fact some universities have multiple <laughs> business plan competitions within their universities. Uh, don't overlook those. What we're trying to do is get, uh, by the way, some kind of uh, uniformity in terms of what you have to provide to compete so that you don't have to write a completely different set uh, business plan for this competition versus this one, you can largely use the same business plan for all of them and makes it easier for you to participate in all of them. So I encourage you to pursue that path. And when you need cash for general operating and you're getting close to commercialization, there's a couple of programs that uh, are available to you for operating capital. One is, well I guess we did introduce I guess the latest program is a grant, isn't it? So yeah, I thought we were going to quit doing it. Okay. Brand new program. Uh, business accelerators, and that does not, that's not limited to smart zones. 
but business accelerators around the state are now being pre-qualified, and assuming they are, you can go to them and ask for some uh, assistance uh, with your business plan, with your strategic thinking, whether it be marketing or product development, uh, with assistance with preparing for uh, uh, your patents, uh, doing some FTO work, where you operate kind of uh, consulting, those kinds of services. No matter where you are in the state, you're now eligible for that. And I talked earlier about the smart zones and what they have. Well, they, the smart zones have a geography limitation. This program gets rid of the geography, blows the walls away, and allows you to go to a business accelerator who can tap into a state fund that can provide basically the same kinds of services at the same level and do it as a grant, no matter where you're located. So you could be in Adrian, you could be in Traverse City, not anywhere near a smart zone and still access uh, those kinds of resources uh, to help you get to commercialization. Now once you're about there, to commercialization that is, which is either uh, raising private equity, a significant amount of private equity from professionals, or to your first commercial sales, or some kind of a partnership with uh, a manufacturer, another corporation, etc. If you're about there, there are a couple of programs you can take advantage of. Uh, one is what we call microloans, and those are starting to pop up all over the state as well. The first one was created as a uh, sub-element, uh, sub-fund, sub-pool of money within the Michigan Precinct Capital Fund. We started out two years ago, we set $1 million aside to provide small loans, meaning micro, meaning less than $50,000, to startups that are clearly not bankable. You're not going to get a loan from anybody else. But you need, and we recognize, the state recognized, that you need a little bit of capital to get over the hump to be able to get Jody's attention or another angel in, or a VC's attention. <coughs> And if we could provide you $20,000, $30,000, maybe to finish your prototype or to finish off the website that you're going to use and as part of your marketing strategy to help hit the road and do your uh, um, trade shows, et cetera. If you only needed that amount of money, you could come to us and apply and actually get a loan. Uh, the loan is about the nicest loan you will ever see in your entire life. It starts out as a subordinated note, which means uh, it's the last loan. Any debt you have, it's the last one that will get paid. And we built into that loan structure where not only any current debt you have, but it's already, we've anticipated that any future debt you get will stay subordinate. We don't ask for any warrants. We don't ask for uh, uh, personal guarantees. We do have a 12% interest rate. Then, uh, in addition to that statewide program being available, you'll find and check around in your local community, a lot of economic development organizations around the state are thinking about doing this themselves. In Ann Arbor, we've actually got three. We've got the pre-seed fund, the state one, which we can tap into, like all of you can or any other community can. But the city of Ann Arbor, through our local development finance authority, created a microloan uh, fund for companies located in Ann Arbor. And then the county of Washtenaw created a fund that uh, is available to companies in the eastern part of our county. Uh, I'm finding that they're talking about and actually creating similar funds elsewhere around the state. Detroit uh, created the first step fund, uh, where similar kind of models, similar kind of criteria, similar size uh, loans and investment. Then you have the pre-seed fund, which is a co-investment matching fund, uh, which is intended to be an investment in your company. Uh, basically, it's a uh, up to $250,000. The state will co-invest in your business. Requires a one-to-one -one match. Requires you to reach out to uh, someone like the Grand Angels or the Great Lakes Angels uh, to uh, attract at least uh, half of what you think you're going to need or more, and then apply to this fund for up to $250,000 as a match. They get. We get the same terms that you've negotiated with the other investor. So we've taken ourselves out of the uh, position of having to negotiate terms with you. We'll take whatever the other, whatever you've negotiated with somebody else. 
The decisions are made by professional investors. About 40% of the deals we send to our investment review board do get turned down. It is not an easy process. It's not a competition. We take every deal as they come along. You can apply anytime. Uh, it's all done virtually. So there's no uh, presentation, there's no set dates by which you have to have things in. Um, but anyway, there's up to another $250,000 of 21st century job fund money you can access. The whole idea behind all these programs is to get you from where you're at now to commercialization, which is where Dale and Jody want to see you and they start investing. And the whole, and, and so our goal is to get you to that point, and at that point, let the private sector determine your fate. At that point, the state's kind of done as much as it can possibly do for you. At some point in time, and we've kind of designated that's it, the marketplace will dictate your future as well as your own ability to grow that business. And we want then the private sector to take you the rest of the way. So that's uh, kind of a quick snapshot overview of all the things that are available to you if you are a Michigan-based startup company. And believe me, there are entrepreneurs all over this country that wish they were here to take advantage of us. Any questions? Hey, um, before we start our questions, I'd like to give a shout out to Paul Rhodes. Paul, you want to put your hand up from the MEDC? Um, if you want money, go see Paul. Just kidding. <laughs> As Skip said, the MEDC has kind of gotten out of the, the grand business. So, um, questions? About any of the sort of aspects of funding from banks to whatever? Go ahead. Um, two questions. Um, first, is there always an extra, ex exit strategy with uh, venture capital firms, or do you hold a percentage of companies for a long, long period of time? No, they're, they're not, always... Not by choice. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> So essentially all, essentially all venture capital funds have a finite life, lifespan, and it's typically 10 years. Okay. So what typically happens is we make our investments in the first three or four years, and knowing that they're going to be held five to seven or eight or nine, right? <laughs> if we get to the end of the 10th year, we as general managers have to actively make a decision as to how we're going to disgorge the investment. It will either get put in a separate LLC, uh, in the case of dividends, for example, you have a pharma company where you're getting royalties, or, or you might dividend out stock. But we, we have to be completely out in 10 years. So the further we get into the life of the fund, the more conscientious we are of the investment horizon. Mm -hmm. So for our fund, we're just in just starting year two. So we've got a long runway in front of us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then for an angel, um, is there usually you know, matching type, you know, series, or have you ever found somebody who had nothing to bring to the table, you know, um, you know, if they're, if they're playing, or if they already invested a small amount, maybe not nothing, but. Um. So it's your really, your question really is, does the entrepreneur have to put some money in the deal before they come to an agent? Correct. The answer is yes. Mm -hmm. We want you to have skin in the game. We want, we want you to, you know, have the same interests as, as the investors. Now, how much you put in depends a lot on what your resources are. We, we've invested in um, some young people not very far out of college. We don't expect them to have a lot of capital to put in their company. Mm -hmm. uh, we've also invested in some cashed out entrepreneurs. We expect them to put a lot of capital in the company. So it, it all depends. Is that, is that what you used to negotiate your percentage or your stake in, you know, in the individual? In part, yeah. In the great big hammer. Yeah. yeah. That's the other part. <laughs> 99 Yes, sir. Programs like SBIR look like they have opportunity areas that are being solicited from the agencies. Um, to what extent is that the list of the only proposals that are entertaining? Did, did everybody hear the question? I'll read you now. Okay. So the, the question is, do the, do the agencies ask for specific areas, specific topics to receive proposals on? Uh, the mission-oriented agencies like DOD and NASA are very specific on uh, defining what their problems are in detail and asking for new solutions. They'll even tell you, we tried this approach, we tried that approach, they didn't work, we, we need some new ideas. And you must respond to one of those topic areas. Other agencies like National Institutes of Health are very broad. If it has anything to do with human health, we want to hear your idea. 
and you'll find a home for it there. So it depends again on, on which of the agencies. DOE, any idea? DOE is sort of in between. They have uh, broad areas and then subtopics under those. But one one subtopic is always other. So if you're if you're in the general area, you can you can propose. My name is Dan Davis. I'm here for Flint. Uh, in 1987, I applied for and won an SBIR grant. Uh, I'd like to do that again for a new company, new product, a whole new idea. But where do I get help with writing a grant application in the Flint area? Uh, so he's the man. <laughs> so Paul is a uh, group, uh, uh, Michigan Strategic Fund, uh, funds BBC to run a statewide uh, proposal, it's basically a statewide SBIR assistance program. And we provide two kinds of assistance. One is training, agency specific training on how to, what goes into a proposal and how to write it. And then coaching on a one-on-one -on -one basis as you, as you write your proposal, we review it, we, we critique it, we recommend um, how to improve it. Do you have a, a grant writer? Um, we won't. We can't write your proposal for you because we'll never know your technology as well as you do. So you have to produce the first draft, and after that, we'll tear it apart and put it back together the right way. One more question. I, I have an existing prototype that needs a lot of prototype development, not really business development. Prototype development to get it, refine it. Is that still? Since I have a working prototype, am I still eligible? Yes, as long as you can convince the reviewers that, that what you're doing is innovative, that it's not just a, an incremental improvement on what's out there, um, and, and that you're addressing a significant problem, significant in terms of the uh, point of view of the agency. Just by way of background, I, in a previous sort of incarnation, <coughs> I did a fair bit of work in grants, and I probably got maybe three million myself, three or four million grants over my lifetime. And word of advice, don't do this alone. Get somebody like Mike's group to help you. If, depending on what it is and who you're submitting to, like National Science Foundation, get a scientist to write it just because they know how to write it. They know the style of writing that these people are looking for. And working with a group like Mike's really, really significantly enhances their success rate. Staying on the uh, topic of grants, understanding they don't have to be repaid, are there any other um, potential downsides from the standpoint of, say, federal grants that uh, they wind up sharing in whatever you've discovered? The, the company maintains all rights to the intellectual property that's developed. The, um, if, the, if the original technology, and the company has to have rights to practice the technology, so if it, if it wasn't invented by the company, if you're licensing it, you have to either have an option or a license to that technology in order to do the, the grant proposal, the grant project. Um, if, it, if the technology was originally developed by the federal, through federal funding, then the federal government typically has limited rights data rights to the, uh, to the technology, meaning if you choose or are not able as a company to, to make the product or the technology available on the marketplace and the government feels that it, it needs it for itself, it can, it can find someone else to do that. It has never happened in the FBIR program. There's no examples of that kind of march in. But, uh, but in general terms, the, the, uh, the company owns the technology that results. Just a, another aspect on that, though, is if you're looking for other types of funding, some funding sources, like, for example, venture capital has historically not looked well upon people that get a lot of SBIRs and, and STTRs. It depends a little bit, though, on what it is. It's, it's very, depends on the facts of the case. Like, if you've got, if you've gotten an SBIR to do, as this gentleman was saying, develop a prototype into the next generation, and that's what you've done, that's fine. That's, that's good for you, you manage to leverage some non-dilutive funding. If you look at the history of a company though, and in the last six years, they had six phase ones and three phase twos, and they're all on different topics, that denotes a lack of focus that makes people run for the hills. Question about uh, angel investing. Uh, you're with a group of angel investors. Are there, how, are angel investors 
conglomerating, or are there a lot of independents versus groups? I know that there are several groups in the area, so I'm just curious as to you know, size and how you work with individualism. I mean, there's both. There are plenty of angel and individual angel investors out there who obviously can make a decision pretty quickly if they want to. Mm -hmm. um, but there are an increasing number of groups in Michigan. There are a few more that have formed again in the last year or two. So we have um, we have six pretty active angel groups, I guess it would be fair to say, and a couple that are trying to get going. Um, you know, from, a, from an investor perspective, there are advantages to, to going either way. I think from a, an entrepreneur's perspective, let's say if you happen to know an individual angel who will sit down and talk with you, you probably can get an answer pretty quickly. The advantage, though, of going to an angel group is that you probably know we have 39 members. You've got 39 people. They don't all have expertise in your space. But you, you know, you've got a whole group of people who also have networks. And so you have access not only to that group of people, but all of their networks in terms of the skills that you might need or the doors you might need open to take your business to the next level. Is there any kind of disadvantage uh, or baggage that's associated let's say being an angel investor, um, uh, history and um, uh, loans, and then trying to go through a traditional venture capitalist? Well, that's a great question. So the question is, is there any baggage that comes along with running the, running the gamut from, for, let's start with friends and family, and then uh, angel investing when you get to venture? And the only vestige really is about valuation of the company. Right, as an investor, I want more of the company than you want to give me, right? That's how it's always going to work. Angel investors and indeed friends and family are the most um, favorably inclined to, to uh, valuation. So the, the only time it becomes an issue is if the valuation is artificially high. And we've seen a couple of cases where, where uh, in one case, a doctor created this Me Too sort of product and it was kind of interesting, and he said, this is the greatest thing, it's going to set the world on fire, and the companies were $60 million. And we said, well, what are you talking about? So we were, we were out of the deal, because if we were to come in, we would say, really, your company's worth about $3 million at best. And so what happens is that, that creates ill will from all the previous investors uh, and the entrepreneur, right? It, we're, we're looked upon as, as being vultures at that point. So as long as, as, long as the valuation is kept in check, and the angels typically do a very, very good job of, of injecting realism into it. And we have to recognize where we are. In the earliest stages, it, it's, it's the difference between potential energy and kinetic energy. It's all potential when the rock is on the top of the hill. It becomes kinetic when it starts rolling downhill. And so recognizing that's where we are in this, in this uh, scale is really important to them. So that would be the only issue I'd say. I, just to add to that, there, there's a few little technical things that occasionally you'll see in sort of the way the deal is structured. Um, and the way to avoid that is get an attorney to do the, the angel deal or whatever financing you do that really works in this area. I mean, it's the same with anything else. And you don't go, if you're an adult, you don't go to a pediatrician. Um, there's probably about a half dozen to a dozen decent attorneys in this state that are used to doing these sorts of deals. And, are used to structuring them, use one of them. Um, occasionally we see weird stuff that we've got to fix, and again, it's just an issue of creating, you know, potentially ill will. But um, whatever you do, don't use a divorce attorney. <laughs> 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 Let me go ask you the same thing in multiple avenues of help, not just one single question. Do they kind of assign a person to you so you don't have to re explain yourself every single time? Yeah, the question is, you go to the SBTDC, and it, it would be true if you went to a smart zone or any other business accelerator. Uh, are you assigned one person who works with you all the way through, or do they toss you around one to another? And uh, the answer is, generally, you'll work with the one person all the way through. However, uh, none of us know everything, and so when you start to get dive down into particular issues, there may be areas of expertise that that person you've been working with doesn't have, and you really want them then to refer to someone else within the same team, but has that particular expertise. Um, 
And so, for example, the SBTDC has a guy who's particularly strong on the financial side. And you may have been working with a guy who's very strong on the technology side, and when you get to that point in the business plan, hey, now I need to create a sophisticated pro forma, he may say, well, now talk to John over here, and he'll help you with the, with the accounting piece. So, but uh, generally, you know, we all try and, once you're working with one, uh, maintain that uh, uniformity. Thank you very much. Um, the, uh, there will be another session starting in half an hour um, in, the, in the other room. I don't imagine you want to get this all over again. Thank you very much for coming. I'm, I'm just pushing the record button I know very little about. Right. Sorry. 